Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you uh, good morning. literally or figuratively. Uh, we know that a lot of you are online and we're hoping that um, the work that we did this week on revising the way that we mic things, the way that we amplify things, the way that we record and uh, everything will enable you to hear the people who are in the room rather than waiting and just you know, watching me listen to people and then repeating back what they said. So we'll see if it works today. If uh, it, it, it felt like it was gonna work last week uh, or, or this week when we tried it, uh, when we tested it. So we'll see if it does or not. So thank you for being here and here. And uh, if you are coming in and you're live, we have study guides and I'll be providing written study guides or uh, texted or email study guides uh, all through this series. So um, there'll always be an opportunity for you to download the study for uh, today and you can print it out or you can find a way to watch it uh, as, you're, as you're watching this. That might get a little tricky, but uh, you can probably do it. So we're in the book of First Peter and this is our first session in, in the introduction uh, up to the book. So let's have a prayer and see where we go. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your servant Peter was called by you, was one of your elect, was one of your sojourners on this earth, uh, and that he has called us through the Holy Spirit to be the same, to be those who are called by you, by your foreknowledge, those who are elect, those who are sojourners or pilgrims on this earth, knowing that our real home is in heaven. We thank you that you have enabled him to, uh, in the past, write these words for us because we too are in times of trial, just as the church was in his day. And we pray that we will be strengthened and encouraged and challenged at the same time by reading what they did in the midst of, that, of their challenges so that we in the midst of ours might have the kind of courage and endurance, perseverance, insight that they had. We ask all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, will someone online unmute themselves and just say, hi, I'm hearing you fine, or hi, I'm not hearing you fine at all. <laughs> hi, I'm uh, hearing you fine. This is John Neese. Okay, thank you, John. We can see you too. You're looking pretty good. <laughs> uh, Jim, you're in the back table there. Could you say something in the, in the tone of voice that would be asking me a question so that we can see if they're picking up what you're saying here? Last week, you asked me if Edmund Burke was 20th century. I said, I think so, and I was wrong. He was 18th century, but we all know the quote from Kennedy was 20th century, so I get half a point. Okay, <laughs> Jim gets half a point. Uh, how, how many people online were able to hear him um, and uh, understand him? I could hear his voice, but I couldn't understand what he was saying. Okay. Same here. <laughs> All right. His response was just like my kids. So um, <laughs> we may try um, raising the volume on your on your uh, device there that you're listening to, Andrew. Um, is it? Is that the mic right there? That is, and we yeah, might be able to. Does it make sense if, if one of us wants to speak and just stand up and stand closer? That mic. Yeah, that might make a lot of sense. Um, if you're comfortable doing that, okay. and keep your mask up. Yeah, um, and, and I'm going to tilt this just a little bit more towards that. Uh, I'm assuming that you can still hear my voice. So, sorry to take seven minutes of precious time to talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the introduction uh, material that we sent. I find this, this man uh, to be very engaging and uh, very uh, supportive of the uh, authority of scripture and how scripture interprets scripture and how he takes what Peter says and matches it to what Paul has said and what John has said and what Luke has said. He's very good uh, at those kinds of things. Good morning. And uh, so we are uh, in the introduction and if, if you'll slide down, I'm going to slide us down to uh, the questions, keep going, keep going. Keep going, 
There you go. It's right there. Pretty good. Okay. So let's ask ourselves the question after you have read the material, or even if you haven't, because we're going to go through part of it. Uh, who was this epistle, this letter, which is what epistle means? Who was this written to originally? Who was his original audience? Most of the uh, authors that I read as I was studying for this uh, today suggested that it was to both Jews and the Gentiles. Because it's, Peter does a fascinating thing. The Holy Spirit leads him to speak <clears throat> in terms of uh, what Jewish people had always heard from Jacob and Abraham forward uh, with language that Jews would recognize, with references to Jewish culture, history, biblical knowledge that Jews would nod and say, yep, we know all about that. But at the same time, he uses language that only Gentiles might understand, or uh, language that suggests that he's also wanting to include people who don't know Jewish background, Jewish uh, history, uh, the Jewish writings, the Torah, the Psalms. Uh, so the, the conclusion generally is that, yes, he's writing to both uh, Jews and Gentiles. And he uses um, an, an interesting word in verse 1. Okay, guys, thank you very much. I think uh, you can both head on over to the sanctuary and uh, do some great work over there. Look with me at verse 1 of First Peter. And uh, he uses a great word that is very informative, I think, for us, especially in our day, facing all the chaos and craziness that we have in our society. Uh, the first thing you'll notice in verse 1 is that the very first word identifies the author. <laughs> yeah, Peter. And uh, the, the thing is, uh, it was not uncommon in uh, their day to write something and claim to be someone else as you're writing. Because that would give you greater authority, it would give you greater um, uh, clout, I guess, you know what I'm saying? And in their day, it wasn't near as uh, looked upon askance as it is in our day. In our day, we'd say, that's plagiarism, okay? Uh, in their day, it was, it was kind of a, a mode of communication. Uh, so someone could, could pose as St. Luke. And uh, the, the only way that you would know that it wasn't St. Luke was by verifying with other people. Hey, did St. Luke really write this? So here's a, an interesting thing. We always need to look back in church history and ask ourselves, was this the author that the very earliest church agreed was indeed the author of the book? And um, in the first 200 years of the church, Peter is always identified as the author. There's, there's no other suggestion. And uh, Mark, you think, might have helped Peter a little bit. And uh, also, there's another helper that we'll talk about in just a moment. But here, uh, Peter, an apostle, a sent one of Jesus Christ to God's, what's the word? Elect. And then, comma, strangers. And the, uh, the interesting thing there is that uh, the word strangers there, does anybody have in their version the word pilgrims instead of strangers? Most of us are using probably NIV. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Sojourners to elect exiles. Okay, to elect exiles or to elect sojourners in some? Uh, yeah. 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 Good, okay, good. And those are also <clears throat> every bit as valid as pilgrims because when you think of a pilgrim, or a sojourner, uh, or an exile. That's somebody who is in a place where they normally would not be. They're going through something that ordinarily they might not undergo. Uh, if you take a pilgrimage from Jerusalem uh, to somewhere else, you are a stranger going through a strange land. And it is unlike your living there. It's unlike your uh, belonging there. And this is going to start for us uh, something that Peter will talk about in both his first letter and his second letter. And that this is the idea. 
that we are the church and we are the elect of God who have been chosen by God or seen by God to be here, but to not be of here. No matter what country you are a Christian in, you are a Christian in Turkey. You are a Christian in the UK. You're a Christian in Iowa, which is where uh, our nativity figurines that we see every Christmas look like uh, those nativity figures are from. Uh, Mary and Joseph look like we, you know, live in Des Moines. So we'll fix that next year. Um, at any rate, <laughs> the the thing is that we need to be aware that uh, as a lot of our hymnody says and a lot of our uh, theology says, we are citizens not of here, but of heaven first. And the real tension that uh, is, is here in First and Second Peter is that they are citizens in the Roman Empire, which is violent against what Christianity is becoming for all kinds of reasons that we we'll talk about. And they are within a culture that is against the message of Jesus, against the followers of Jesus. And so Peter is going to have to spend some time talking about how we as the church can be great citizens of heaven and at the same time be great witnesses to the country or the land in which we live and to be responsible citizens in the country or the land, which for him was tough because Nero was in power. And you know Nero, I don't even have to say probably a little bit more than that. Um, so he refers to us as pilgrims. And um, the second word there is of the dispersion. You see the word exiles? Or scattered? Who has the word strangers in the world scattered? And I mean, a couple of people. Uh, who has the word exile there? A couple of others. Okay. The King James says, to the strangers scattered throughout. Okay, to the King James, to the strangers scattered. And that's what NIV has as well, strangers in the world scattered. Um, the, the, the Greek interlinear I'm reading is, it refers to it as dispersion. Yes. And and the Greek word is also an English word, diaspora, is the, the root. So perfect. Thank you, Joel. Uh, I, I admire anybody who looks at the Greek interlinear and says, ah, that's what that word means, because that is <laughs> that is the clearest way to figure out what's being actually referred to. And the, the, the date diaspora, uh, if you if I had a blackboard, I'd show you the uh, the prefix dia uh, means through uh, or um, uh, suggests travel. Uh, and the, the diaspora is the phrase that was used for the Jews who were exported from their country in the 200 year span of their utter defeat, first by the hands of the Assyrians, second by the hands of the Babylonians. And then Jews not only were scattered because they were taken in exile, but they were also enterprising people. And if business was bad in Jerusalem, well, maybe we should go to here to Syria and work there. And then they go to Syria. Or they'd go to Alexandria, Egypt, which was a thriving culture at this time. Or they'd go to Rome. So there were Jews all around the Mediterranean world. And the technical word for this is diaspora. They are scattered. Uh, or they are exiled. And it's the same great truth for you and me, which is why Peter chose to use this word. We Christians are scattered. We are exiles from our true home, heaven. But we are in the world, and we are among a people to whom we are called to introduce Jesus. But we are now the exiles. So when Jewish people read uh, this, this verse, to God's elect, oh, the Jews would say, ah, that's us. Strangers in the world, yeah, that's us. Scattered, that's us. And then he goes through all those names that you can hardly pronounce. Um, all across the Roman Empire, the Jews and now the Gentiles are going to learn, yep, they're strangers in a strange land. Who wrote that? The book. Huh? Sounds like John Upright. 
Sounds like it ought to be Heinlein or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's the same kind of an idea. And so um, at, at some points along our way, we are going to talk about uh, a real hot topic that uh, I hope to make as, as lovingly clear as I possibly can, but we need to address it because we're thinking about it all week. And if we don't address it, then what good are we doing? And we need to talk about the things that we're experiencing all week long. And one of the things that we're experiencing is a great confusion between being a member of the body of Christ, the Christian church, and being an American. Because in a lot of ways, people are mixing the two and equating the two in a way that God does not ever invite us to think. And in a way that is leading a lot of people into making some assumptions uh, that are absolutely not what God has in mind and is not biblical. So along the way, as, as Paul talks about being a citizen of Rome, but being a citizen truly of heaven, we're going to be talking about these things too. And I hope I don't lose anybody. Because, you know, because I know that this is a, this is a real hot topic and uh, people might not want to hear it or, or not like what, what uh, the Bible has to say about it. Uh, but please hang in there. Don't, don't, don't fail uh, just because uh, something that we discuss in the Bible study here doesn't quite agree with the way that you view the world. Stay open to that. Any question about that? Because I don't want anybody to be thinking anything that I'm not intending or uh, anything that we don't, uh, an impression that we don't want to give. Well, I, I certainly agree with that. And I think it's a timely uh, thing to bring up. So. Okay. That's an affirmation. Is that Joel? It is. <laughs> Joel, do you know Greek? I know a little uh, Greek. Basically, uh, I've been typically reading uh, the inter uh, Greek interlinear for my New Testament study, and that's been going on for about 30 years, but I've never gotten into the uh, actual learning all the, uh, you know, declinations and so forth in any systematic manner. So that's kind of where I'm at. I, there's a lot of vocabulary I know, but, uh, and I had two years of Latin in high school, so I understand the, the, the basics of how it would be fit together, I think, but haven't actually formally studied it. Well, let me assure you that you don't need to uh, worry about the declensions and all of the, the grammatical kind of chaos, but uh, any of one of you, any one of us at any time can Google Greek interlinear, based the word, interlinear or Mark 1, chapter 1, you know, and up will pop, boom, it's an English translation, I always use uh, NIV, always uh, and it'll show you the Greek word that was used at this uh, point for you to then later investigate. And how you investigate it is you hover your mouse over where they invite you to hover it and click. And that will take you to a page that shows you everywhere in the Bible that that word is used, how it's translated, what it originally meant. And you'll think, I'm not smarter than I thought I could be. <laughs> you know, because the, the original language that, that is written in tells us so much about uh, what the original author was intending to say. And uh, it also shows you how tough it is to translate some things into English uh, or into any language. And this is why we have so many different translations for the Bible, because it really thinks that we do it better than the last time. My favorite comment about reading Greek is uh, at a church I used to belong to, one of the, uh, I think he was an elder there, said one of his friends said, reading in Greek is like reading the Bible in high definition. Yeah, it's HD Bible. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I like that a lot. Also, um, as is true for most things, with the uh, Greek interlinear, there's an app for that. So if you're interested in just having it available all the time on your device, there's plenty of uh, choices. Exactly. So thank you. Uh, in, 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 oh, there's also BibleHub.com. Okay. BibleHub.com. BibleHub. H-U-B. Oh, H-U-B. Yes. Uh, BibleGateway.com is my favorite uh, online Bible resource. I think that works too. Yeah. Uh, 
Yes, Andrew. Uh, so this topic of being a citizen of God's kingdom as well as a citizen of the United States, how we how we do that. Um, I have had a thing for the head of the city and being in the country. And it's interesting on a Sunday morning I can walk into a church in Austria, in Switzerland, in Germany, in Poland, and there is an instant level of comfort, uh, simply because we are all identifying ourselves as followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And and I can simply, you know, before and after the service, I can sit in the Bible study class with this one over here, I can do it over there. And I, it all feels very familiar. Um, and so there's a universal connection. I love that universality of the gospel that it is the same thing that is being expressed in verse uh, one here, where we're talking about being in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Virginia, all of those uh, places being in uh, what we would now consider to be Turkey, but very different dialects, very different cultures, even within that one Asia Minor uh, cluster. And it's, it's true when you do. I said I, I've, I've experienced it myself when I was in Haiti. Um, the, uh, we, we would ask people, well, is there a Lutheran church here? And they kind of chuckle and say, well, when you're in a place like this, the, the flavor of Christianity you are like, doesn't really matter. Because you get together and you're all the body of Christ. You know what you're really in an ecumenical situation there that had to be. And that's just great. That's just fine. Because we, uh, in spite of this, all proclaim one Lord, one faith, one baptism. What I'd like to do is, um, in, with regard to question number two, what internal evidence suggests these both pilgrims may have included Gentile Christians? I want to just read this one paragraph that you'll see uh, if you have your study guide. Uh, on, per, on page one, it's under recipients. I thought this was well that. Uh, so I just want to read it out loud to you. Peter refers to the recipients of his letter as, quote, pilgrims of the dispersion. And the term dispersion is found in John 7, 35, and was used to describe Israelites who had been scattered following the Assyrian and Babylonian captiv activities in those 200 years there. Now, this leads many to suppose that the epistle was written to Jewish Christians, as was the case of James' epistle, which we talked about last time we uh, studied James. However, there is an indication some of his readers were Gentile converts who had come to believe in God through Jesus, and that Peter at time applies the term dispersion to Christians in general, just as he applied other designations to the church that were formerly applied to the nation of Israel. So he concludes, Peter's initial audience were Christian quote, pilgrims, exiles, strangers, foreigners, sojourners, who were living in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia provinces in what is now Turkey. Paul had ex traveled extensively in some of these areas uh, so that the gospel had been given much opportunity to spread through his writing. So this is going to be very important for us uh, as we think about what Peter is trying to get across to us who are, as Christians, scattered across this world. We are the dysphoric, the diaspora, however you want to uh, pronounce that. And uh, we talked about number three, the question that uh, we uh, are talking about people who live now in the area of Turkey. And the people, the person who assisted Peter, uh, what did you guys find out? What was his name as you found it in Chapter 5, verse 12. Silas. Yes. Uh, Silas. So in 1 Peter 1, 12, we're told, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that you have now been told by those who have preached the Holy Spirit to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Uh, why am I not finding this? Because I'm supposed to. 5, 12. I That's why I'm not seeing. Okay. With the help of, there he is, Silas, who I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you, this is Peter speaking, briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the truth.
true grace of God. And he says, stand fast in it. And here's why this is important. You need to realize that when many what we now call books of the Bible were written, whether they were epistles, letters to churches, or whether they were gospels, which is a summary of the work of Jesus, there were various ways that those were composed and various ways that uh, resources that people used in the composition of it. So Silas comes alongside Peter in some kind of way that we only know a little bit about. And he helps Peter think these things through. It could be that uh, Peter, who is a fisherman, who has a fisherman's education, which is not a whole lot probably in his day, is struggling to explain things in the way that uh, the Holy Spirit is, is uh, inspiring him to do. And what happens is Silas suggests a word as he's there, Peter, uh, with Peter, and Silas is writing. And Peter says, yeah, that's a good word. Write that one. And, and here's, here's why we, we can summarize that. This Greek is beautiful Greek. It goes way beyond what a fisherman's education might be able to compose. But if Silas has an education, like St. Luke, who was a physician, had an education, then all of a sudden you're having beautiful Greek coming out of the mouth of a guy who used to own a small business in a boat. Okay? So uh, it's just interesting. And in other places of in the New Testament, you'll see references to uh, an amanuensis. An amanuensis, an amanuensis is someone who could read and write, who had studied the classics, who knew his Homer, knew his Plato, knew his uh, so uh, you know, Socratic philosophy and all that, and uh, was eloquent. And you'd hire uh, someone to listen to you, and he would write. And a lot of letters that we now have in the New Testament were written using secretaries, we would call them, or administrative assistants. We would call them that. And it was it was a, a wonderful solution to the fact that a lot of these people uh, didn't have the kind of education necessary to write this. Well, uh, also, it was just technically harder to write something back then. We've been spoiled by word processors and such. Yeah. Yeah. It, it took a lot of, uh, it was expensive too. Um, you know, people had to make ink and ink was expensive. People had to make parchment or papyrus uh, and, and to, to, to write in a way that was legible and in a way that was uh, clear was a, a very difficult thing. Now we, we voice text and you have a couple of mistakes, but it looks pretty good that you said it, you know. <laughs> then it was, a, it was much more difficult. Good. So uh, Silas is also called Sedanus. Uh, when was this epistle probably written? Uh, we believe that it was in the years 63 to 64, as you read, I think, uh, there. And it might be, it could be, that uh, the neural persecution was just starting. And Peter, who was martyred under Nero, uh, might have thought to himself, I don't have much time. I'm a marked man. They're coming for me. So he speaks this epistle out of the urgency of knowing that he's about to inherit his full citizenship in heaven. Uh, so he has just enough time to talk to the disciples here, the citizens here, uh, still left on earth. Yes? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the outline, but I noticed that I'm hoping in the first chapter, and then I noticed in the second chapter, but mostly because they had no review from the sermon before, that Peter does what almost everyone else who writes in the New Testament does, and he quotes scripture. And so in uh, 116, he says, Because it is written to be holy, bride, and holy. And then in 2, 9, and 10, he references the Lord's priesthood. And uh, I'm not smart, I'm just smart enough to write this down. You took us back to Exodus 19.6 in a sermon that pointed out where God used the phrase for a priesthood. Yes. So I, I always think it's uh, interesting and, and a good reminder to us to pay attention to Scripture when the people who wrote Scripture pay attention to Scripture. 
Absolutely. And uh, Jim's comment was how Peter used scripture to and quoted from scripture of the Old Testament, especially to verify what now the Holy Spirit was saying through him and to validate it. And here's the interesting thing that sometimes happens. Um, when people in the Bible uh, culture quote Old Testament, they, they are pretty free with their translations. Um, when Jesus stands up, uh, no, that's, that's not a good illustration. There are times when the apostles or Jesus is quoting a psalm or Moses, and they'll, they'll say it in such a way that you think when you go back to the psalm and you'll say, well, that's kind of it, but it's not exactly it. They didn't really bother about that. I mean, they weren't really worried about quoting it word for word. They were because mostly they were quoting it from memory, right? Having been in the synagogue, listening to their teachers, it was all audibly uh, you know, given. So they had, they took great liberty <laughs> with scripture sometimes. Maybe, maybe Jesus, who is, is the word, got it right, and David wrote it down wrong. There you go. <laughs> Maybe David wrote it wrong. Good. Aaron. I was going to say, this also helps put some, some relatability to the people who wrote the script. Because we do the same thing in Bible studies all the time. Yep. When we remember, oh, you know that part where it says, uh, repay not people for evil, where we all kind of know, yeah, that's, that's in the Bible. Yeah, it, it's in there somewhere. Yes. But we might not be quoting it exactly word for word what's written. Yes. So yeah, that, that exact same thing. Exactly the same thing that we uh, will quote from memory and we'll get close and everybody around us will say, oh yeah, that's I, I remember what you're talking about, but it's not word for word. It's the same thing in the, in the Gospels. Um, so where was uh, Peter? And this is a kind of a fascinating thing. Peter says it a couple times. Go with me to Peter chapter 5, verse 13. And uh, after he gets done talking about that, the fact that Silas has helped him, he's a faithful brother. Uh, I have written to you and uh, to encourage you to testify. Uh, then he, word, he uses this, this phrase, she who is in Babylon chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son, Mark. Now, uh, the best translations or the best interpretations of this suggest uh, that they are thinking of the church in the same way that sometimes we will refer to the church as a feminine thing. Uh, there you go. The word she is in there somewhere. I can't remember the lyrics. Uh, Jesus prays for everyone. The, the church is one thing. The church is one foundation. Yet she on earth has union with God the three in one. That's it. Yeah. So we refer to the church as a feminine, uh, as, as a, in, in, that, right, in that phrase, because of examples like Peter gives. Peter's talking about the church, but he says she. Then he uses the word Babylon, which uh, suggests a couple of things. Um, now, if uh, Peter is talking about literally Babylon, and it's not impossible uh, that for some reason he would be in the Euphrates uh, area, which is now Iraq, um, that, that's possible that maybe he's meaning that literally. There's another Babylon that was referred to that he could also be from. Um, in that area, but uh, in the book of Revelation and in other testimonies that we have from the early Christian church, what city was famous for being referred to as Babylon? Rome. Rome, yeah. Because everything that was wrong with Rome had been wrong with Babylon. Uh, as great and as wonderful as a civilization that that was, both of them. And as advanced in their uh, art, their science, and their understanding, their philosophy as they were, uh, morally, they, there was a lot to be you know, desired of them. And uh, Rome was similar to Babylon in that way. Also, uh, the Jews were dispersed to Babylon. And so, and so now Peter is talking to those who were scattered who are Christians in the Babylon, the new Babylon in Rome. So, so Peter's going to die in Rome. 
He talks a lot with the people in Rome because he knows that that is the center of great communication and an area that the church can thrive in. And doesn't that happen in the first thousand years, the first 1500 years of the history of the church? Rome is the center not only of the, the empire uh, and then civilization, but also of the church. So interesting stuff. And um, so it, uh, number seven, are we still seeing that? Yes, we are. Uh, that could have referred to Jerusalem or um, uh, that places where the, the city is symbolizing. I don't know that Jerusalem would be uh, called Babylon necessarily. And then, is it that one considered to be anything that's in opposition of the true word, the true faith, and the like? And so, if you have citizens that are captured or in or working from a place that is not um, thinking the same way, that needs to hear the gospel, that needs to that be talking to that remnant that's there instead of uh, and the church. And the she with the bride is Christ. Yeah. So so everybody would have understood that to be before the bride, we are made up of other things. But we will be stupid. Who's gonna be in heaven? And when he comes again, we are what will go with him into heaven. Yeah, and as John describes it, um he sees the vision in heaven of the church as a bride beautifully adorned for her uh, suitor. And um, I, that, this, it, this motivates me to uh, go to the epistles and find out who spoke first about the, the church as a bride. Because we're really early. You know, 63, 64 is only, what, 20, 30 years uh, since Jesus has ascended into heaven. So uh, if, if that was us, we'd be talking about 1980. Things that happened in 1980, you still remember them? So, okay. Um, <laughs> so, but, you know, it, it's recent, it's new. Now, there are, there are epistles that uh, were written in the 70s, uh, 80s. Uh, so this motivates me to wonder who first wrote about the church as the bride of Christ. You know, John, but John's gospel was the last book written. Uh, Revelation. So, yeah, that's a good thing. Okay. Well, certainly Jesus's parables, uh, you know, constantly referring his coming to a wedding, that sort of implies that the, uh, you know, who's he getting married to? Well, the church is implied, yep. I think. Yep. And if you were Jewish, wouldn't you understand God's people as bride? Absolutely. Oh gosh, it's all, over. yeah, it's all over the Old Testament. How, uh, especially Hosea, uh, was he the one that was a fourth? God said, marry the prostitute. Hosea said, really? And God said, huh? So Hosea does and to illustrate that the children, the people of Israel, have uh, been unfaithful to their husband, who is uh, the king of heaven. And uh, all through the prophets, they are called an adulteress. People because they are supposed to be the bride. Yeah, it, 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 it's all connected, you know. And, and, and when you look at it as being all connected, it just opens up a world of understanding. So, um, we are just going to go as you know, uh, the spirit moves. We're going to stop here because we need to get ready for worship. But I hope that this has been a time when you've been uh, built up and encouraged to know that nobody in the church. Has nobody in the church right now is in a position that has not already been dealt with by people in the past, starting with the early church. We think, and, and here's a here's a word that we need to jettison. I'm gonna say it, but I'm never gonna say it again. You ready? Unprecedented. <laughs> we need to stop saying that word, mostly because I'm so tired of the document that. But uh, nothing is unprecedented in the church with what we're doing right now. It's all been dealt with before. You know, we just need to get in the word and find out how and say to ourselves, oh, that might give us an idea. 
as to how now we can be scattered and be alive and be disciples. Yeah. Andrew? Um, so one of the, uh, yeah, uh, one of the, there was a battle on the headline that was study finds 2020 was the worst time in history to live, provided you didn't live at any other point in history. <laughs> <laughs> in case you didn't hear that, the, the, the headline of the Babylon Bee, which is kind of a satirical um, endeavor, was uh, 2020 was the worst time ever to be alive, unless you happen to live in any other section. Um, so <laughs> that was good. All right, well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the uh, application that you make to it. Uh, of it to us here in any time, in any era, in any situation, it's all been done before by the disciples of Christ. So turn us, Lord, to the word. We're looking for answers. Turn us to what you have said and how your people have already dealt with all of these things that we are currently now engaged in. And Lord, then we will be more effective in calling the disciples. We pray that, Lord, because we are yours. Our work will run. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.